and we are and here we go. Um, a couple of things about using the link. Don't forget to turn your video on, and that's done through the video drop-down menu and at the top of your screen right above your picture of me. Um, if you're going to be speaking, you can adjust your volume um, on your microphone and also your volume so you can hear me. And that's done through um, the little megaphone and speaker icons. I will normally mute you if um, I hear some feedback, but if you would like to add to the conversation, then you just click that little icon and turn your microphone back on. Please do add questions or comments to the chat during the presentation. Or again, if you have your microphone on, um, or even if you don't, you can turn your microphone on and then just start talking. And if you have your video on, which I hope you do, then we'll be able to see you and um, it's like we're in the same room, which is great. So let's get started. What is Dino? How do I start using it? And what can I do? Those are the kind of the three main topics of our session today. I'm going to start off with a little poll, just asking you some information about what you already maybe know about Dino, if we have any prior knowledge in the group. So I've opened the poll for you. If you could go ahead and click and reply a little. OK, great. So let's just take a moment and have everyone share, either out loud if your mic is on or through the chat, um, what you already know about Dino. The only thing I know how to do in Dino is monitor other people's, my students' computers. Okay, perfect, Chloe. Thanks for sharing. What about Andrew James and Wendy? Um, okay, so they're responding in the chat window. Can view students' computers, remote control, shut down, or send messages. So you know quite a bit, Andrew James. Um, and so does Wendy. Blocking, lockdown of computers, send messages. Great. You all listed lots of different things. So um, it sounds like for some of you, some of the parts of today will be a review. And for others of you, um, we'll get some new information out, I hope. Okay. So. Um, what is Dino? It's two parts, and you all have already mentioned both the parts of Dino that go together. Um, the first part is, is the classroom monitoring tool. So like Chloe pointed out, you can view thumbnail images of what's going on on your students' laptops. Um, and then the second part is that the classroom management tool. Um, and those are some of the things that Andrew James and Wendy talked about where you can use Dino to remove some of the potential distractions from your, excuse me, from your students. And you can also um, do kind of some blocking and control. I didn't see anyone talk about sending and receiving files. And maybe you know about that and just didn't mention it. But that's one of the really powerful things um, in classroom management also that can save you a lot of time. Um, and I know that when you know, you're in the classroom, you're so short on time, it's really important to get um, those transition times to a minimum, and Dino can really help with that. So, how do I start using Dino? The first part is to install the teacher version. If you don't already have the teacher version installed, um, you can do that through um, some directions that are in the Help Center on Staff Link. And if you're unsure how, how to do it, you can always contact the CFC and um, they can virtually deploy the Dino Teacher version to you. After you've done that, we're not going to take time to install the teacher version today. Um, you can just follow along with me. And I, I'm guessing that most of you already have it installed since you, you talked about using it a little bit. Um, you're going to log in with your Kent School District credentials like you log into your computer. Then click Start Monitor and choose a class to monitor out of your list. Um, your lists are updated nightly based on Skyward rosters. So if you have a new student, um, once they're enrolled in Kent School District and have a student number, and once they're put in your Skyward roster, it takes about the next day before they show up um, in your Dino roster. If you're ever missing a student in your Dino roster that you have 
in Skyward, please do call the customer support center and let us know right away um, because there's obviously a problem there. I have a test class that I'll be demoing with today um, that I just have a couple of test students in. So you can watch and see what I can do. So what are some of the possibilities in Dino? Um, this is just a quick little list. And I'm going to have you go ahead and use your marking tools um, underneath the, the slide that I'm displaying here to so go ahead and grab either a pen tool or a checkbox or um, even just the typing tool and go ahead and make some check marks next to the things that most interest you today, um, similar to voting. So I'm just going to read the list and as I go along you can grab a check mark and um, place a check mark next to something that you think is really interesting. So we can direct student attention, we can send and receive files, we can block applications, filter URLs, open and close applications, open URLs for the students, send a poll, and remote view student screens. Okay, so I'm getting some check marks in there. I'm just going to give you a moment to place some um, check marks next to things that you are most interested in learning about today. I'll give you just another moment to do that. What is remote view screens? So remote view screens is um, what we were talking about earlier where you can view the student machines from your okay, so I'm not going to check that because I already know how to do that okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thanks for joining us Alita I see you're there um, we're just getting started and I hope you're able to jump in with us I just took attendance so we're all set okay so send and receive files I'm so glad that was one of the top um, requests because that's one of my favorite features in Dino um, and how can I direct student attention? Okay, so this just kind of gives me an idea. We, we don't normally cover absolutely every feature in a one hour tech talk and this gives me a way to direct um, the training to make sure we cover the things that are most important to all of you um, in the training today. So at this time, I'm going to head over to uh, Dino. And so I'm going to share my Dino session with you. And you should be able to see now it's loading. You might have to accept the share on your screen. Um, but I've loaded up my Dino test class. And you can see there I have a Kentwood test student um, account, just Kentwood student that I'm monitoring. So, um, and that's on the laptop that I have sitting right next to me. So I'm going to go ahead and open, for example, Internet Explorer on that student machine. And you'll be able to see, um, in a moment that thumbnail refresh. Speaking of, I'll just click refresh and it's going to update um, the thumbnails and pull new information and then you can see the student has, um, the student laptop has Internet Explorer open. So let's just talk now about um, a couple of the features across the top of the screen that you um, pointed out were pretty important for you to see. The first one is direct student attention. So the attention button here in the top left is a way that you can lock down student input devices, so their keyboard or their mouse, and call their attention to something on um, either to you or just redirect them. Now all of these buttons that have drop down arrows, that means there's additional information that I can set up. So, for example, I'm going to click the drop down arrow next to attention. And I'm going to set up plan. And what that does is allows me to change the message. Maybe I don't want to send out attention, please. Maybe I want to send eyes up front because that's something that I say to my students. Eyes up front, and that means that they need to, you know, stop what they're doing and look to me for directions. I'm going to click OK. Um, and you can see a little pop-up here in the bottom right corner, applied attention message eyes up front to all workstations. And now if I see my student, and I'm going to go ahead and click on view screen and just look at this one student. Here 
here it goes. You can see this is the student machine. And, and, and just trust me when I say right now I'm clicking on the student laptop. I can alt tab. I can control alt delete. There's nothing I can do on my computer but stare at this eyes up front until the teacher releases that plan, it's called. So as the teacher, I can then go and click on the attention button again. It's basically toggle on, toggle off. But now the student is back to being able to do um, what they're here to do. Now, when you're watching just one student screen, it is a live view, click by click. There's about a half a second lag just because it's over wireless. And you can watch what the student is working on. Um, if I don't want to watch just this one student, I can click Stop Viewing at the top and go back to viewing everyone at once. Okay? So I'll go in and out of that viewing just one student at a time so you can see what's going on on the student machine. For example, um, the next set of buttons works with the files. And that's something that three of you pointed out was something you wanted to see today. So I'm going to go ahead and send a file to the student. To do that, I click Send Files, and then add a file to this um, launch area, just like I'm attaching an, um, a file to an email. So I'll go in here and just grab, let's say, um, a sample picture, chrysanthemum. Okay, and there's the sample picture. And then I, have, I can choose what I want to do. Do I want to just send it to the student's desktop? Do I want it to launch as I send it? Or do I want it to appear mysteriously on the student's desktop? Um, obviously, there's reasons to do either one. Um, for example, I might use this to minimize my transition time by choosing the launch feature and then saying to my students, let's go ahead and take a look at this now. It's sending the file out to the students, and it's actually already appeared on the student machine sitting right next to me. I know you can't see it in the thumbnail, but the student machine has it loaded and ready to go. Which means um, that the student didn't have to navigate to the file, stop what they were doing, find the file. Um, I'm now viewing the student machine, and this is what the student sees. You can also see that it has saved to the student's desktop right over here on the left. So the student doesn't have to remember to you know, put it in a special place. We would like them to save, of course, all files to their H drive. But there it is for the student to use. Another way that teachers use this feature quite a bit is to send a file during the student's work time. So for example, I might choose the Lighthouse file, send to desktop, and not launch it while the students are working on a particular task. Now it's sending just kind of in the background. And when I'm ready, then, I can say to the students, OK, I'd like you to go ahead and stop what you're working on, um, minimize what you're working on, and go ahead and go to the Lighthouse file I've just sent you. It should be on your desktop. Um, and then the student can go and find that and open it. So two possibilities there both of which are going to save you lots of time because your students are no longer having to go out and find something on a network drive. Now, the opposite of send files is request files. Request files is where I'm sending a request to the students for them to submit something to me. So I'm going to go ahead and model that now. I'll show request files. I get to customize the message. So I'm going to ask the students to submit your sample Submit your um, reflection now, okay? And then I click Send Request. Now what happens out on the student laptop, I'm going to show you. This is the student laptop that we're looking at again. The student has Submit Your Reflection Now. Okay, if the student chooses to cancel, then you have to resend the student that request. And you'll get a notification as the teacher that the student has declined your request. Um, so it's as if they're, they're telling you, no, I'm not turning it in. It's <laughs> um, kind of funny. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be the, the student who's turning their work in and click Add File. And this is, again, what the student will do. And I don't have anything at all 
on this computer because it's just a, a demo computer. So I'm going to find um, that chrysanthemum file and open it. Okay, and then the students can actually add more files than that if they choose, but I'm just going to do one for now. And click Submit All Files. And they're asking, are you ready to submit? I click yes. And then the student can continue working. Meanwhile, on the teacher computer, here's what I can see. That the Kentwood student turned in file name chrysanthemum.jpg and then it's a complete download. And you can see this is saving to a folder. In my documents, it's made a folder called Dino Documents. And then name the folder, the title of the class, and the date and timestamp that you collected. Um, now the class title is based on your Skyward titles, your Skyward roster. So it might have, you know, algebra period 308, um, and then the date and timestamp. If I go to view folder, this is one of my favorite, my favorite things. I'm going to have to share this with you in just a moment because it opened up a different program here. Here we go. You should be able to see that, that in this folder, in my documents, in the Dino Documents folder, it's renamed the file, the name of the student, and then underscore name of the file. Now, the great thing about that, well, there's a couple great things. The first one is they'll be automatically in alphabetical order by student last name um, in this folder in file Windows Explorer. The other nice thing is that you don't have to worry about the student's naming their files correctly, because it's going to rename it based on the student's submission. Okay, so that is a really exciting feature that, um, you know, most teachers, as soon as they find out about that, start using right away, because it's something that can be used um, just in just a lot of different applications for that, um, for that tool. Okay. So, let's see here. I'm going to pause just for a moment and ask if there are any questions about attention, send, and receive, or, um, no, sorry, attention, or send, and receive. And I just had a ding reminder on my computer that I should be in this meeting. And I am. So let's just. Okay. So no questions at the moment. All right. So we've talked about directing student attention and sending and receiving files. I'm coming back to check the list because I want to make sure we hit what um, we need to for today. Blocking applications, opening and closing applications, and sending a poll. Okay. So I'm going to go back now to Dino and show you um, the application information. So to block application, this is done through setting up a plan, much like we did for the attention button. So I'm going to go down here and choose set up plan. Okay, and I have some that I've already created, but I'm going to make a new one just for um, showing you this today. And I'm going to make a plan called Let's see. Maybe I only want them on. Uh oh. There we go. Maybe I only want them on Word and uh, Internet. So they're doing some research. Uh, and, no, then I want them on OneNote. <laughs> Hang on. We'll put them on OneNote and Internet. So then this takes a little bit of technology savvy, um, unfortunately. Because you have to know where to look in this list. So I'm going to go down to Microsoft Office and choose OneNote and add that to the plan. So if you look over here, I'm blocking all except OneNote 2010. And what else do I need to find? Um, some way for them to get to the Internet. So Internet Explorer and Mozilla Firefox, which are our two district-approved web browsers. Okay. Then I save. And then if I click OK, I've now applied that plan 
for the student machines. And I've got a little notice down here in the bottom right, Applied Blocking Plan. And you notice that this button, Block Application, is selected. It's orange. I also have an indicator over here in the Monitored Workstations list that I am blocking. So now as a student, I can get to Internet Explorer, okay, but I cannot open anything up. So if I go into my Programs menu, for example, and try to open Paint, it just doesn't open. <laughs> Nothing happens. There's no pop-up that says, oh, you're not allowed. It just plain old doesn't work. Um, so I can, however, open, what did I decide on? OneNote. Okay, so there it is opening OneNote. So that's something that I've allowed. And I can get to Internet Explorer as well. Okay, so blocking applications um, is a pretty common tool. A lot of teachers prefer that the students do not use um, certain, certain programs during the school day, depending on what they're doing. So they might block the Internet, for example, during um, a paper quiz where students can use their notes. Or they might block um, OneNote <laughs> during uh, an online quiz where students can't use their notes. Um, we can also go in and allow all except. And that's something that gives you a little more flexibility. So, for example, if I just am so tired, you know, of seeing the kids on paint all the time, I can go in and block only paint. So now I'm allowing everything else on their computer except paint because I am tired of, you know, seeing them screwing around on paint. Or I can go in and say, you know what, um, I don't want them using uh, their you know, Microsoft Math Calculator for this project. I want them to do it by hand, so I'm going to add that, but they can use anything else on their computer. A word of caution when you're using block applications. You may not think ahead about exactly what your students need. For example, if you are sending a file to their desktop um, and and then the students have saved it to their H drive at some point, and you want them to go open it from their H drive. If I'm blocking everything except, you know, that one program, they actually can't navigate to their drives because that's done through Windows Explorer, um, which is I have to go in and find Windows Explorer. Hold on. Um, and I'm blanking on where that is even. I'm sorry. Shortcut. Now, the shortcuts, there's another thing. I just got a little sidetracked. Sorry. The shortcuts folder contains all sorts of applications that we launch virtually, that we get to virtually, that aren't installed on your computer. So, anything in the shortcuts folder has to be selected in bulk. So, if you want them to use, for example, Atomic Learning or Audacity or Gizmos or Geometry Sketchpad, that needs to all be added to your plan through shortcuts. Um, if you want them to be able to open a PDF, then you have to allow um, Adobe Reader. So think through your plan um, ahead of time, because there might be things that you're not thinking about that they then are going to need to use later on. Now again, to turn this off, I just click the Block Applications button. And that plan is released, and now the students can get to anything on their machine that they'd like to. Okay, so now the student's looking at a picture again. And that picture was closed um, from them when I was blocking applications, and now it's popped back up on their screen. Um, open and close applications works kind of similarly as far as I can launch something for the students and then close it for the students. So, for example, maybe... I want to reduce my transition time. I don't want to wait for every student to find Microsoft Math in their programs list. So I'm going to click Launch Microsoft Math. And then on the student's laptop, I'll see that Microsoft Math is opening. Let's go to New Screen here. And Microsoft Math is opening on the student's laptop. So instead of me, you know, waiting for every student to be ready, I can actually be giving directions while the program is opening without waiting um, for the students and without spending 
that transition time waiting for the students to find it. Closed applications works in a really similar way where I can then select any one of the students open applications and close them. Please note I have two options here, safe close that allows them to save what they're doing and force close which may cause them to lose their data. Um, I highly recommend making sure that you're allowing students to save what they're working on before you force close anything. Um, I can't imagine as a student being more frustrated than if this teacher closed everything I was working on. So that's open and closed applications. All of that goes together in a tidy little set. So I'm going to pause now for questions before we talk about polls. Are there any questions about applications? And you can add to the chat window or you can start talking if you have a question. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about um, a poll now then. Thanks, Andrew Zoom. I like the feedback. Um, so what would we do to send a poll? Here I am in Dino. I'm going to click Send Poll. Now I have four different possibilities. Multiple choice, and then I have a set um, of options. So A, B, or A through F. True, false, yes or no question, or a Z, don't know question, um, which means there's not going to be a correct answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to choose multiple choice and just three options. And then I can choose whether or not to receive answers anonymously. Um, many teachers like to keep track of their poll and see who responded what and then use those, use that information for reteaching groups um, or for a quick score on an assignment. Um, so I'm going to leave this logging student name. Okay, custom question. So what? Um, was the most important part of the video clip you watched for homework last night. This is going to be an entry task. As they come in, they've watched a video clip on Habitat, and they're going to come in, and I'm going to just see kind of um, who, who really watched the video, or at least who got a good understanding of it. Let's see, so animals in different habitats, people in different habitats, or climate in different habitats. Okay, next. So now, this is actually displaying on the student screen. I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like. So here we have the student screen loading, and the student has my question and then those three possible responses. They simply click one of the buttons. Okay. And then the poll goes away. So it pops up on their screen in front of anything they're doing and then goes away as soon as they've completed it. From the teacher perspective, I've now received one out of my one possible answers. And I can either start over or close it or I can go in and get the results. So I'm going to click results. And of course, I only have one student responding, so it's not super exciting. But I have um, a count of the respondents, and I can look at it in a chart, a graph, or by student name. Now, notice here that I didn't mark anything correct. This was more of a, um, a poll, a true poll, than a quiz. I didn't have something that, that showed if it was correct or not. Let's start over. And this time I'll do a true-false. And my question will be, it, um, does an animal move habitat? No, sorry, that's a question. Animals move habitat. And then it's going to do the same thing, just asking the student for um, their response. And once the student has responded, then I receive the answers and I can check the results. So 
So very straightforward. Now the, the only problem, kind of the bummer about holes, is they don't save. You can't create like a, you know, a whole list of holes that you use year after year after year and give them to students um, as they come in for entry and exit slips. In fact, um, this poll, the only possibility for me is to start the poll over, but when I switch to another class, like period five, the poll disappears. So if you have something that's, you know, long and, and detailed, this probably isn't the best use of the tool. This is more for something that you can just type in quickly and get a quick check answer because you're going to have to redo it at the start of every class period or maybe at the end of the period before. And then as they come in or maybe during their work time, you're creating a poll that then you distribute toward the end of class. Um, lots of options there, but know that it is not good for saving, you know, curriculum polls that you'll use over and over. If you're interested in creating um, polls or surveys that you'll use over and over throughout time, you want to be using something like E1 uh, because that's, that's the best feature for that possibility. I can also capture the results of this poll, um, and it will save that in a notebook here, just a little list of who put what, and then I can come back to it and um, check it at another time, like if I'm going to get it a score. Okay? So that is the poll feature. Let me get out of here. Okay. So let's go ahead and just do a little bit of sharing really quickly. Um, I'd like everyone to contribute either out loud or to the chat window. Um, one thing that you've seen so far that you would use, you know, right away in your classroom. Give us one idea of how you would apply one of these tools. I'd like to use the um, block application because all my algebra students, they use their e-text. Mm -hmm. And I find them very often emailing, <laughs> so whether they're emailing answers or just emailing to talk, um, emailing on the internet, using their, you know, listening to music or whatever, but I'd really prefer them just on the e-text, so it would save me from writing, getting a lot of people in trouble because when the whole class is on there, it's hard to monitor every single computer at once. It doesn't even fit on the dyno screen. <laughs> right. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And that brings me to something that um, I'm kind of alluding to, and that's that, you know, nothing will ever replace you, the classroom teacher. You're obviously yeah. the very best management tool in that classroom. So students have a plethora of methods they use to get around the system. You know, they'll try to run a browser off a thumb drive, and they'll, you know, try to do split screen so that you can only see part of it. And mm -hmm. they actually spend a lot of time trying to work the system. So um, while Dino is a really great classroom tool, it's certainly not fail-safe, and the very best thing you can be doing for kids is giving them, of course, interesting, dynamic, you know, content that, that they're engaged in, um, and then giving them some help along the way by removing some of the distractions that you can. So the thing that Chloe was talking about actually um, takes us into URL filtering. Um, URL filtering is something where you can allow students to only see certain things on the Internet. So it's actually filtering their Internet traffic. Whether they're using Internet Explorer or Firefox, they can only see a certain thing. Um, to do that, you have to set up a plan. So let's see, I'm going to allow MathBook. And then I have to know the URL of the website, and I also have to know how to put it in correctly. So, for example, if the site, and I get this wrong all the time, so I'm going to pause just for a minute <laughs> and show you one of my plans that's set up correctly before I um, send you off in the wrong direction. So let's see here. Um, so, if the website contains a www at the start, then you want to put in asterisk, dot, and then the website. So like Google, dot com. If the website does not contain a www at the front, then you want to just put in the name of the website, like nbclearn.com, um, because it starts archive, 
dot, oh, I could even put that in, archive.nbclearn.com. Um, and another word of caution is that sometimes websites actually use third-party login scripts or pop-ups on the page that you are not aware of. And so if you're trying to filter and it's not working, um, give the Customer Support Center a call, and we have some tools that we can use to try to help you find out you know, exactly which websites you need to allow in your filter to make sure it's working properly. Um, you can also send an email to Dino Support, which is just support at dino.com, and they respond pretty quickly, um, and they can help you figure out filtering. But filtering is one of those tools that a lot of teachers are excited to use, but um, it's actually the most difficult thing to set up. So, let me check back in the chat window. Um, Andrew James is going to use the eyes up front. And yes, and just redirect attention. Um, you can also um, use the attention screen for something like um, a, a share out. So, for example, maybe you're um, doing, you know, you're watching a video together as a class about, you know, something in history. You pause the video. And you have set up a plan um, for share one way that wars uh, war start with your partner and send that out. So you're actually giving them a direction um, and focusing their their laptops on one thing. So maybe they're they have one note open, you know, they're taking notes on what you're talking about or the video. But then in the, in the moment, you're going to have them stop and do something. So don't forget about using attention as a direction. Um, we're always trying to make sure everything in here is used, you know, in the best possible way instructionally that gets you more time and more benefit um, out, of, out of the system. Okay, so great ideas. What about um, Alita? Did you have something to share? Um, Alita, I have a note here that you are on a device that doesn't receive instant messages. So I'm not, but I got one from you earlier, so I'm not sure what that is about. Um, but when you get a chance, go ahead and participate in the session because we'd love to hear from you, and um, it's just part of being in the session. We'd love to have you. Okay. So let's go now back to our Dino PowerPoint. Okay. Um, what can you do now beyond this session? Um, if you're stuck using Dino, the very best thing to do first is to call or email the Customer Support Center, and they're at extension 7030. You can also send an email to the CSC, of course. Um, we also have a fully stocked help center on staff link. So if you're not aware of the Help Center, um, you should be, because the Help Center is an excellent tool for getting information about all sorts of um, programs that we have in Kent School District. I'm just going to show you quickly how to get there. So when you're on the KSC homepage, you're going to click Staff Link. And then I'm guessing that you cannot see that. Let me open it in the same way. Here we go. Okay, and then um, on the tabs across the top, almost all the way over to the right is the Help Center. And here we have all sorts of technical support for um, most of the programs that can pull us So I'm going to go down here into Other Applications and go over to Dino. And just give you a look at the Dino Help Center page. Um, we have a training video, just some information, a training presentation. So if you know someone or work with someone that's like, man, I wish I would have gone to the Tech Talk, you can direct them here, and they can watch me do a training video, or they can click their way through the training presentation on their own. We also have the user's guide and some how-to documents reminding you um, how to do some of the most common features. The one that I think is really important to look at is the URL filtering quick guide. So if you are doing anything with filtering, 
it is a great idea to make sure that you um, have the URL quick filtering guide in front of you because the URL filtering guide lets you know those special rules um, that I shared earlier about setting up plans. It also gives some examples, hopefully you can see this on your screen, some examples of web addresses and what's put um, to allow it in the filter. Some of these things you would not ever think, like the person success net requires this Roomba address because that's what they use for their login credentials. So things like that that we can help you figure out if you're ever stuck using a site. But some of these are the most popular in our district, so we've provided them for you on the help sheet. So just a reminder, use the help center when you're stuck, um, as well as, you know, someone in your building and contacting the customer support center. Okay. Um, last but not least, just a reminder, we are nearing the end. This is actually the last tech talk for this school year. Um, you're eligible to earn clock hours after attending a minimum of three sessions. So if you've done that, you'll be hearing from Program and Staff Development probably early next week about um, how many hours you qualify for. And then if you'd like to pay for those clock hours and earn them, you absolutely may. Um, all of that will go through Program and Staff Development, not through me. And then you have until June 22nd to submit um, the payment for those clock hours for professional development time, okay? So, are there any closing questions about Dino? And I do have a closing poll that you'll be responding to, so don't log off quite yet, but I wanna give you a minute to ask a question if you had anything that I didn't cover that you were curious about or something that I didn't clarify well. Okay, no one's even typing. So I'm gonna go out to my exit poll here if you could participate in that for me. Um, how do you see yourself using Dino with your students? We talked about monitoring and that's just watching what they're doing on the screen, maybe doing some blocking and filtering. Instructional, which is where you're um, sending and receiving files, doing polls, launching applications, launching URLs, um, minimizing that transition time, keeping students engaged in your classroom, um, or then in the middle. And it looks like we're mostly in the middle, um, which is great. Um, so thanks for joining us on our Tech Talk today. I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. If you have any other questions later on, you can always email me or Lori Kirkland as well. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank time. you. Bye, Chloe.